Let's go ahead and uh, watch this video. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So far, this entire year, we've been bombarded by opposing sides of a political fight, attacking each other and attacking each other's supporters. There has been a massive uncovering of people who have endured sexual harassment in all sectors and walks of life. The opioid epidemic is killing hundreds every day. The U.S. has endured massive hurricanes that destroyed communities, and Puerto Rico uh, has still not come close to recovering. Right now, it seems like all of Southern California is on fire. And just weeks ago, Las Vegas was victimized by the worst mass shooting in United States history. Around the world, oppressive government regimes still exist in places like North Korea and Iran. Syria continues to be ravaged by a civil war, as does Yemen. Terrorists in the Islamic State, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, all enact senseless violence on innocent people. White nationalism has roared back onto the scene. We just made it past Thanksgiving. Maybe made it through some loneliness or some awkward family dynamics. Followed by fending off shoppers for Black Friday deals. And now we're into work parties that we don't really want to go to because we'll be with inebriated co-workers who we don't really like when they're sober. On the weekends, we're playing Destruction Derby in the mall parking lots so that we can go into stores to max out our credit cards and drain our bank accounts. We're doing all of this to have another or, or lonely or, or awkward get-together because we're celebrating a poor couple giving birth to their first child in a room that's usually only used by the animals because that's the only space they can find on this government-mandated trip to pay taxes. This trip will soon be followed by running away as refugees to a foreign country to escape the maniacal, petty puppet king that has ordered a mass infanticide. We haven't even touched on the, like the emotional and psychological war going on in each side of us. And so I say to all of you, Merry Christmas and peace on earth. 
And, and you might be regretting your decision to come to church today. <laughs> like, is this as good as it gets? Don't worry, it gets better. Uh, today we continue to celebrate Advent. And, and our theme for today and this week is peace. And it seems naive to talk about peace or, or expect peace in this world that we live in. It's like I, I have this gif. It, it's like the beauty queen, Miss Congeniality singing, grown up Christmas list kind of level of naive. Uh, let's see. You remember that movie from Miss Congeniality? It's like, it seems that naive. If, if Miss Congeniality was singing grown up Christmas list. It's strange that peace it is such a prominent theme of this holiday season because there's, there's nothing really all that peaceful about it. I, I don't know a whole lot of people or maybe I don't know any people who feel like their lives are peaceful right now. It, it's busy, it's hectic, it's stressful, it's crowded. But if I asked you, how are you doing? I don't think peace is what's going to come out of your answer. And, and the first Christmas isn't really all that peaceful either. Uh, I don't know where we got the idea of like a silent night where everyone is sleeping in heavenly peace. Because it's, it's not in the, in the story at all. That's, that's not what's going on. My wife is seven months pregnant and there are no peaceful nights. It's, it's, she's uncomfortable and awake most nights, uh, either dealing with back pain or going to the bathroom. Uh, I was in the delivery room for our first two kids, and I'll be there for our third kid. Peace is not an adjective that I would use to describe that moment. Joseph, in the story, is trying to figure out how to take care of Mary and also pay a tax bill. That's, that, it's not like, it's not like hey, he can fill out the form and know how many tax. He has to go to the tax collector who's corrupt and will decide how much his taxes are. How much does the tax collector want to enrich his own pocket that day? So what is this peace thing all about? Today I want to look at a part of the Christmas story uh, that's not featured in our nativity scenes. You won't find it in any Hallmark movies because it's one of the most hurtful, despicable, chaotic events. And so in the midst of that, why do we look for and celebrate peace? If you have a Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 2. At Sought Church, we're seeking God while He seeks us. It's what we do, and we explore the Bible on our journey. And so, if you don't have a Bible, we want to give you one. We have a paperback copy out at the concierge cart for you, for you to take and explore for yourself, or you can download one at bible.com slash app, uh, because it's an important way that we seek God together. Matthew uh, is one of two accounts uh, in the uh, that records the events surrounding Jesus coming as a baby in a manger. And so he is uh, one of those accounts. And I want to look at what he says uh, starting in verse 1. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law, and he asked, Where? Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah... Are not, least among the rule, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you, who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. So then Herod calls for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them when the star first appeared. And then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. Well, after this interview... The wise men went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. And it went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary. And they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, 
and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route. For God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. And that night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet. He said, I called my son out of Egypt. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A cry was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead. There's a tapestry that hangs in the hallways of uh, a Vatican museum. And it's titled, Massacre of the Innocents. And it it shows mothers clinging to children and and soldiers killing babies. That, That doesn't make it into the nativity or into our Christmas carols. It certainly doesn't seem to fit with the same story It's it's all the same story where the angels fill the sky and they declare, peace on earth. This story is horrific, but familiar. We just lived a version of this story on October 1st. A madman taking innocent lives. Unfortunately, This is a story that gets relived over and over again. And you and I certainly can and should ask the question, what does this mean about an all-powerful God who declares peace on earth? Is there a God? Is He all-powerful? Does He really want peace? I mean, those are all questions that confront us, especially in this season Where peace is such a prominent theme. When we read or experience or or hear about stories like this, we, we often wonder, why didn't God stop it? And it also makes us question the chaos of our own personal lives. Not just the the big events, but but why doesn't God step in and make my life? My relationships, my job, my family, my finances, my sickness. Why doesn't he he make that peaceful? We look at events that disrupt the peace and we ask, where is God? Like I'm sure many of the families in Bethlehem did. I was thinking about this, and, and, and uh, I, I, I thought of uh, just a different question. What if the horrific events are the symptoms and not the disease? What if the massacre of the innocents and the mass shooting on October 1st and broken relationships and and the death of a loved one or, or, or any of the other things that we wish that God would stop, what if those are the, the times where evil and chaos breaks through in the worst way, but, but it's always kind of rolling around and lurking underneath the surface? What if all of creation and every person has chaos at work within them? Then the bigger question is how can God bring peace to that? 
not just the symptoms, but how can God bring peace to the disease? And I know that that might seem like a, a, a cynical, dark, depressing outlook. It doesn't make you want to say Merry Christmas. It's, it's strange to think of the world where, where everything and everyone around us it carries this chaotic disease that could break through in the worst way at any moment. And it would be dark and depressing if Jesus had not come. But we celebrate Advent to remember the baby who comes and to look forward to the King who will come again. The Bible begins with this description of the earth as dark, chaotic, and, and then the Spirit of God comes and hovers over the waters. And, and God speaks life and order and peace to all of creation. But soon after God has set everything perfectly in order, humanity chooses their own authority and power rather than God's authority and power. And so sin breaks the perfection and brings with it chaos and evil. And so this has been happening since nearly the very beginning of creation. But also since that time, God has been seeking us. And He's been coming to us. He's been looking and, and trying and, and coaxing and, and, and loving us so that He can bring order back to our chaos. So that He can bring peace. He came to the garden with Adam and Eve and He asked them, where are you? And then He started to repair the deep hurt in them without letting the disease destroy them. And God has been doing that all throughout history, coming to us and inviting us to give up our own destructive and messy authority and to come back and to worship Him, to adore Him, and then to watch His authority start to bring peace back to our lives. In stories, we often try and find that character that we relate to, you know, that person that we identify with and, and think, yeah, man, I could be like that. You know, that's why guys walk out or, or walk away from, from a Rocky movie, like ready to take on the world. You know, like, yeah, let's go, let's go. It's because, you know, you're like, I could be like Rocky, I could do it, I'd get back up again. You know, it's, it's, why, it's why women walk out of, of seeing Wonder Woman and, and they say to themselves, that's right, I'm a superhero. Here we go. You know, we, we find this character to relate to. And most often when we're, when we're listening to a story, we, we find ourselves relating to the hero. Like, yeah, that's me. I'm the hero, you know? And, and so the question is, who do we relate to in this Christmas story? Are we Jesus? All right. Slow down. <laughs> most of us would, would never admit that out loud, but sometimes that's exactly what we think. Yeah, I'm just like Jesus. Are we the wise men? I mean, I think we could be. I think we should be. That's what Sought Church is all about, seeking God while He seeks us. So people who are on a journey seeking the King of Kings, bringing ourselves and our gifts and bowing down and worshiping the King, I think we could and should be wise men, but I think most often we're Herod. Now, nobody really likes to hear that. Nobody compares themselves to a, a murderous, violent, petty king. But Herod's problems didn't start when he ordered the execution of children. It started when he refused to go worship the king. See, after the wise men came and they visited Herod's court, why? Why didn't Herod 
and the priests and the religious authorities and all of Jerusalem. It said all of Jerusalem was troubled. Why didn't all of those people say, the king is in Bethlehem? Hold on. We're coming with you. Why didn't they bring gifts and bow down and worship? Instead, they refused to worship the king so that they could hold on to their own authority, their own power, their own influence, their own way of doing things. Because if you go and worship a king, then it means that you are not the king. And if you are not the king, then you have an authority to answer to that is not yourself. Herod, throughout his life, this wasn't the first time that Herod uh, was an evil, murderous king. Herod killed his own two sons because he thought that they might be getting too close to his kingdom and, and his authority. Herod is desperate to hold on to power. He is desperate to hold on to what is his. He is desperate to hold on to the influence that he has. And aren't we the same way? We refuse to go and worship the king and we don't want to give up our own authority and power. We cling to reigning in our own lives. It becomes so addictive that we'll do whatever it takes to hold on to that. I think the church is dealing with some of that blowback right now of trying to hold on to power. As a result, where we rule and reign, it's absolute chaos. Anytime that I have tried to be the ultimate authority in my own life, I have brought into my life chaos. And we think to ourselves, yeah, it's broken, it's a chaotic mess, but it's my broken and chaotic mess. It's mine. Advent is the season where we can prepare ourselves to worship the true king. The season where we look and long for peace prepares us to worship to the one who can bring peace and who can speak to the deeply troubled waters of our lives. I often wonder during the Christmas season, why? Why a baby? I mean, you want a, you want a picture of of no power, no influence. It's just this baby who can't even afford a hotel room. Why a baby? I mean, it would so it would be so much easier to worship this this mighty king, this powerful king, right? Who who it would be so much easier to trust in this powerful king who I know could if I like if I could go okay I see a king. I believe he's on my side and he could force people into peace. And as long as I'm on his side and he uses the force, then I'm all right with it. Why? It's easy to trust and kind of believe and think that I would worship that kind of king. But a baby? A powerless baby? Why that way? And I think it's God trying to show us the way of peace and the ways of peace of how to be a peacemaker. And the way of peacemaking, as weird as it sounds, as backwards and upside down as it sounds, is shown to us in God Himself who became this powerless baby, giving up His own deity, His own authority in heaven, and making Himself submit to the Father here on earth 
so that he could be himself our peace for us. He shows us the way of peacemaking. Jesus, when he's grown, shows up one day and he starts preaching on the mountainside. And one of the things that he says is, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons and daughters of God. I don't think that's just kind of a platitude that Jesus is speaking out. It's one he's already lived out. He is the peacemaker who gave up his own authority, his own deity. He wrapped himself in in fragile humanity is called the Son of God. And He invites us to follow the same way. And so as I look at my life and I'm confronted by a warring, chaotic world around me, But more importantly, I, well, how about this? Not more importantly, more intimately, I'm confronted by the war and the chaos in me. I have to ask myself, how can I be a peacemaker? I don't want to be Herod. Grasping for authority. Grasping for power grasping for influence. Instead, I can follow the way of the peacemaker, the one who is himself our peace, and choose to give that up. As I was praying this morning, I thought, God, this is not like, this is not a feel-good, warm and fuzzy kind of talk. And I know the holiday season is, is, is crazy and it's hard. And I know for a lot of, I mean, we don't, we don't talk about it, but for a lot of people, Blue Christmas is a song that kind of like defines the whole thing. Like it's just, I get that. And I, get, and I thought, God, I don't want to be the person that comes in and just like stirs everything up and makes it even harder. Uh, how can I bring comfort? Because I think that's what God is trying to do is he's trying to bring comfort to a chaotic world. And so the only way I know how to bring comfort is this. In areas where you and I are struggling for peace, we need to find the way to come and worship the king. Stop trying to hold on to your own power. In that video that we played before uh, this talk began, it, I thought it, I, I love the symbolism of, of the person grabbing the cross. The wise men are wholly different from Herod in this story. Why? Because they went and they worshiped. When we come and we seek Jesus and we hold on to Jesus and we choose to say, You're king and I'm not, that's when God's peace can become more evident in our life. And as we do that, we look forward to one day. The promise of Christmas is not just a promise of the past that Christ came. The promise of Christmas and of Advent is that Christ came once and he will come again. And in that day, the lion will lay down with the lamb there will be no more death, no more sorrow, and instead we will be with the king and leaves of healing will address every hurt that we have. God, let that day come.